All right, so I want to welcome everyone tonight for attending our September virtual lecture. A um, couple other preliminaries here is that we're obviously going to uh, do our regular raffle at the end of uh, the talk, uh, the book System Thinking, uh, Managing Chaos and Complexity that uh, our speaker recommended. Um, secondly, uh, questions and answers. I'll leave it up to our speaker if he'll take questions at the end or um, during the presentation, but I would say feel free during the presentation to put questions into the chat, chat window um, and then we can certainly uh, queue them up for answer at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, without further ado, let, let me now uh, introduce our speaker. Tonight, uh, we're honored to have our special guest, one of our chapter longtime members, Dr. Keith Willett. Uh, Dr. Willett is a data scientist and enterprise security architect with the Department of Defense. He's also co-chair of the Encosi System Security Engineering Working Group and also an active participant in working groups for agile systems, resilient systems, system science, and the future of systems engineering efforts. Dr. Willett is CISSP and ISSAP certified. He is alumni of Towson University where he obtained his bachelor's in computer science. He has a master's in business information systems from the University of Baltimore and other masters in science and information assurance uh, from Norwich University, and he's obtained his PhD in systems engineering from the Stevens Institute of Technology. And with all that, I'm gonna turn our presentation over to Dr. Will. All right, the rest of you, you go ahead and mute your uh, self as well as your video and let Dr. Will have the full platform, thanks. Fantastic, well, thank you. Um, let me see, I will do a quick share here. There we go. And if you could just verify you can see that. Okay. Yes. Good. That's Thank good. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, hello. Welcome. Yeah. And as you've heard, I spent most of my life in school. And so uh, <laughs> it, it, it's great to be able to try to apply some of that in some, some creative thoughts. Uh, so about two years ago, uh, John Wade, the technical director of the Systems Engineering Research Center, uh, posed a challenge to me at the, uh, the Washington DC in COSIS. And he said, come up with a vision for what systems engineering version 2.0 might look like. And I asked him, you know, well, what, what basis should I use? And he said, well, just consider it a blank page and, and be creative. Uh, and so I, I thought about that for quite a long time. And uh, this is the result of that initial thinking. And I say, you know, initial, it, it's barely started trying to broach what systems engineering version 2.0 might look like. And uh, I'm looking at it from the uh, perspective of systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility. And I started with a focus on, on systems engineering and engineering methods, and then quickly shifted my thinking more to systems philosophy. Uh, and if, if you've not seen this systemology architecture, uh, it's by David Rousseau. David is uh, very active in the International Society for Systems Science. And he also does a lot of collaborative work with INCOSI. And he has come up with this uh, concept of systemology as a, an advancement and formalization of general systems theory. And so I thought this was a, a good place to start looking and, and thinking about what would the future of engineering look like and started backing up to uh, the science and then ultimately ended up thinking about the philosophy and then started thinking about uh, paradigm models. Uh, what's different from traditional systems uh, today that systems engineering needs to address. And then uh, thinking about the worldview principles. Um, Thoughts uh, around this are to appear uh, in an article uh, as well as a series of articles in the Insight issue in October 2020, which will be dedicated to a new concept called loss-driven systems engineering. And, and loss-driven systems engineering figures prominently in this, uh, the, the thoughts on this systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility. And 
then did a lot of thinking about the, the nature of systems to get this thought process going. So Immanuel Kant's philosophy, uh, it's, a, it's a principle of transcendental deduction or reasoning from the general to the specific uh, with respect to existence of something where that something may include people, places, things, uh, and a priori conditions for the possibility of experiences. Uh, so in, in other words, conditions of the possibility is a necessary framework for the possible appearance of a given list of entities. And so breaking this down, uh, it's necessary and you've got to have a framework to get the results. Uh, it, it, possible appearance is the framework doesn't cause the results. And entities are just an abstract reference to stuff and, and people. And continuing with, with Immanuel Kant's philosophy, uh, the conditions of the possibility, space is a condition for the existence of cubes. If there is no space, then there is no possibility of cubes. And space does not cause cubes. Uh, space is distinct from cubes. And space does not define cubes. Uh, but cubes depend on the existence of space. So with respect to systems engineering as a discipline, uh, we need to focus on systems engineering throughout the life cycle of complex, adaptive, socio-technical systems of systems, including the, the system itself, the environment within which the system resides, the need is to produce development processes uh, and systems or, or solutions, operations uh, that include workflows and environments, which, which may be a system of systems that are conducive to continual dynamic adaptability. And so the, the, the key uh, premise behind thinking about systems engineering uh, of systems in the future is that need for continual dynamic adaptability and engineering in that inherent ability to adapt. So I'm not suggesting at all uh, that we're going to go out with the old systems engineering and, and in with the new. I am suggesting in with the new to accommodate a new concept and a new paradigm uh, where systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility is in addition to traditional systems engineering. So let's shift the philosophy of, uh, of Kant to the philosophy of systems engineering. So systems engineering of the possibility uh, produces a design framework for the possible appearance and variation of predictable and non-predictable system characteristics okay, that include structures, organization of parts, states, behaviors, functions and functional exchanges. And uh, functional exchanges are just uh, communication, inputs, outputs. Uh, resources, which could be inputs of raw material or, or energy, fuel. And content, content of the system, something that is contained within the system that can be virtual, like data, or real, like people in cargo. And results uh, are outputs, and they can have uh, impact, effect, and consequence, where impact is a direct contact and a, an effect is a uh, first order result and a consequence could be an n order result. And then environments um, could be a current order uh, and that may be the ecosystem within which the system resides or a containing whole like a system of systems. And then value delivery. Uh, and this is why the system exists. And this is some uh, customer or some beneficiary uh, that has a need or a want or, or that the system satisfies. So systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility philosophy is the design for continual dynamic adaptability. One goal is to provide value delivery under nominal conditions. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, another goal is to sustain value delivery under adverse conditions. 
The philosophy includes the design for expected and unexpected, uh, where the expected is deterministic, and deterministic systems are, are well within the realm of traditional systems engineering, but also for non-deterministic, uh, which is a new concept to design the system to adapt to things that are unexpected. So we design for the possibility, uh, for example, we design for the possibility of cubes, something that we expect. Uh, however, we get spheres instead, some unexpected thing. Uh, however, uh, engineered conditions are successful because it turns out that our context requires spheres and our engineered conditions provided for the possibility of spheres. So traditional engineering uh, or engineer, uh, systems engineering version 1.0, it focuses on cause and effect, uh, rules-based. It's deterministic, well-bounded, finite, predominantly static. Uh, any deviation from expected is handled by simple systemic structures, simple rules, um, logic gates that aren't very complex. Uh, and anything that requires dynamic adjustment uh, really requires human uh, intelligence and intervention. So in systems engineering version 2.0, or at least the thoughts toward that, uh, we don't abandon cause and effect. It's still necessary. It's just not sufficient for the future of systems engineering. And so the, the future proposes to transcend cause and effect and embrace the non-deterministic the flexibly defined uh, blurred boundaries and highly combinatorial, um, if not infinite, and for sure, uh, adaptability. The intent is to produce complex, adaptive, socio-technical systems of systems that facilitate that continual dynamic adaption. And the systems uh, engineering, the conditions of the possibility, spans the life cycle. Uh, so it's throughout the entire life cycle of the system to facilitate that adaptable uh, process. And so we are looking at uh, adaptable processes themselves, uh, the development process, adaptable solutions, uh, adaptable systems, and then uh, dynamic uh, operations, which are agile workflows, and then adaptable people, or an agile workforce. So as we continue to explore the systems engineering, uh, the conditions of the possibility, I think we need to expand a bit our thinking about what constitutes a, a system of interest. And so here, uh, I, I'm thinking of a system as uh, it could be a social system. Uh, it could be a single person, a couple, a group, organization, a nation, a coalition of multiple nations. Uh, it could be technical some manufacturing equipment, like uh, industrial, uh, that involves industrial controls, uh, computer, car, you know, naval ship, any kind of weapon system. Uh, processes are also systems. So anything we say about a system uh, would apply to the development process of systems engineering. Uh, and then systems can be natural as well, you know, non-human made, or they can be engineered. Uh, also the intangible, like systems of mathematics, and then it can be a coupling of any of these uh, to create a system of systems. Uh, and, and then the context is that which facilitates the expression of meaning and value. So here is a first cut at the systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility uh, framework. And it consists of multiple layers, uh, context to focus on meaning and value, uh, system of interest characteristics to focus on the system of interest, the workflow taxonomy to focus on the system of in interest with respect to purposeful action, uh, and then goals, some expression of purpose, uh, some desired primary outcome. Uh, strategies sustain the goals. Objectives are measurable steps in support of strategies. And then methods uh, include tactics, techniques, procedures, processes uh, that are how to achieve those measurable steps. And then solutions and tools, uh, what methods we use. 
or I'm sorry, um, uh, solutions and tools are, are what methods actually use. And so essentially, goals represent the subjective purpose or subjective ends. The strategies represent subjective means to achieve the subjective ends. And then the objectives are the objective ends and methods represent um, the objective means to achieve the goals, to achieve, to achieve the ends. Uh, so I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that the, the bottom layer, uh, solutions, tools, is the best name uh, for that because it really implies uh, external systems and, and this is not necessarily so within a single system. Uh, these may be components or features or functions within that system. Uh, but within a system of systems, they could indeed be external tools. So I'm still thinking about that, that last layer and, and some better naming convention. Uh, so let's, let's walk through each layer uh, in a little bit more detail. So a context ontology uh, helps with the expression of meaning and value. And a context ontology may consist of, of these things. A, um, it could be socioculture, uh, which it represents the who, the people that are involved. Uh, the context ontology could include technical, uh, which is te technology, some industrial aspect, uh, spatial, uh, which includes uh, environment, geography, facilities. Uh, it's a temporal aspect. Uh, which may be continuous or continue all some peri period or some interval. Uh, it may include behavior, functions and functional exchanges, processes, and then some expected value, you know, why the system exists. And uh, the way I'm thinking about this context ontology is uh, it's also extensible. So if we come up with something else that looks uh, useful, uh, we can add it in here. Uh, an additional thought uh, could be ethics. And this may uh, relate to the encoding of uh, the resolution of moral dilemmas in artificial intelligence uh, that we have to accommodate in, in autonomous somethings, you know, autonomous vehicles or robots or drones. So context generally influences the system design as well as the system operation. So as we transition from context to the system of interest, that context provides for the expression of the system of interest, role, fit, function, impact, and the expression of the system of interest, meaning and value. So the system of interest itself has many characteristics and they're distinguished here as, as structure, uh, just that organization of parts, the behavior, some function, functional exchange, uh, content, which resides within the system, uh, resources, environment, and then value delivery. And that value delivery, uh, it helps provide the desired result under uh, nominal as well as adverse conditions. And there's the need to sustain that value delivery. And that sustainment of value delivery becomes a key focus in designing systems under systems engineering version 2.0 that inherent adaptability that sustains value delivery. <clears throat> so the relationship between the system of interest and the workflow taxonomy uh, is the, the workflow is a subset of, I'm sorry, the system of interest is a subset of people, process, technology, or environment, uh, and, and that is the system of interest represents uh, some constituent part or parts within the dynamic that produces that desired result. And so the, the system of interest may be a complex adaptive socio-technical system of systems functioning within a workflow. And the workflow dynamic uh, among the constituent parts produces desired results. And so you can look at the workflow phase on the left and it provides for some action uh, or trigger on the right. And, and you can read it like a sentence to see the relationships. And so a, a trigger event prompts people to perform processes 
using technology within an environment to produce results for consumption to bring about a desired outcome. And, and you can see the, there's a theme in, in each one of these structures for who, what, why, when, where, and how. Uh, and, and that's, uh, there's a reason for that, and, and it's beyond, on, beyond this. Uh, it's an attempt to try to create uh, structures that go from this conceptual framework uh, into designing some concept of orchestration, uh, which realizes uh, this ability um, to implement the agility on, on the fly. And so workflow taxonomy relation to goals. Goals provide a reason for the workflow, uh, that which the workflow seeks to accomplish. The primary goal of all systems, and, and I'm using that word specifically all systems, is to provide value delivery uh, under nominal conditions. A goal of some systems is to provide value delivery under adverse conditions. Uh, but in order to do that, there is a cost. And so not all systems will, will, have, will, will, will take on that cost, take on that ability. And so a, a derived goal for some systems is to sustain value delivery. Uh, in other words, uh, systems may be viable, uh, capable of producing desired result, uh, and relevant. Uh, some compatible with current desires or compatible with the, the current order. And goals represent subjective ends or, or subjective purpose for the system. So the relationship between goals and strategy. Uh, strategies sustain goals. Strategies uh, that provide for value delivery and strategies that sustain value delivery, uh, strategies for viability and strategies for relevance. And so there's, there's three types of strategies. Uh, there's function-driven strategies, uh, which is really the traditional systems engineering focus. And beyond that, there are loss-driven strategies. And these collectively consider all forms of loss. Uh, and, and, and predominantly address the viability of the system. And things under loss-driven uh, include concepts uh, like reliability, sustainability, survivability, and this addresses the negative side of risk. And, and concepts like resistance and resilience come into play for, for loss-driven. And safety and security are, are definitely part, part of loss-driven. The third type of strategy are opportunity driven. And this is a collective consideration of gain oriented functions. And this is predominantly related to relevance. And, and I've got TBDs in here because this area is, is mostly unexplored. Say over the last 18 months or so, um, part of the Resilient Systems Working Group in INCOSI, we've done quite a bit of thinking on loss driven systems engineering. Uh, and, and it's still, in, in its bare infancy. We, we've yet to introduce it until the INCOSI Insight issue in October. Uh, Opportunity-driven systems engineering, right now it's more an empty phrase and a thought than it is any substance. And so I'm putting it in here as a placeholder uh, to do some more exploration. Uh, but on that, that positive side of risk, there's that need to revisit the system and revise the system and do some continual optimization either through direct result of changing stakeholder needs or the anticipation of changing stakeholder needs such that uh, opportunity driven may actually be uh, preemptive or proactive in the system adjustment. And strategies represent the subjective means to achieve the subjective ends. So objectives are just measurable steps in support of strategies. And the systems engineering uh, version 2.0, such as the thoughts are, um, identifies and captures that which measures effectiveness, efficiency, elegance, reliability, sustainability, survivability, and, and more. And uh, these are certainly not um, uh, definitions, but just more casual, uh, informal descriptions to get the point across. 
So effective is just produces desired results. And efficient, you produce desired results within some specified performance parameters, uh, and so on. And you want the system to be consistent and dependable and renewable. And, uh, and survivable is just some concept of remaining compatible with the current order. And these are uh, the objective ends uh, within the system of interest. So the relationship between objectives and methods, methods provide the tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, the processes for how to achieve the objectives and me methods help achieve the measurable steps. And so method types include uh, function-driven, loss-driven, opportunity-driven. Risk management as a method supports the negative side of risk for loss, uh, as well as the positive side of risk for opportunity, and contains methods for resistance and resilience uh, to address loss, and methods for revisit and revise to address opportunity. And so additional methods uh, include agile, static, proactive, reactive, uh, with room for more uh, as we discover them. And the methods represent the objective means to achieve the objective ends. And so methods invoke solutions uh, in the form of tools and products and services uh, or, or components if it's a uh, self-contained system. Each solution is itself or could be uh, a system of interest. Uh, where a system may be a person or some collective uh, people, a system may be a thing or, or process. Um, the process of systems engineering, as, as we mentioned, is itself a system. And then uh, systems may be natural or engineered, may be tangible or intangible, uh, like a, a system of mathematics. And solution take the form of safeguards that include uh, safety and security. And while not mutually exclusive, a useful distinction is to think of uh, safety addressing accidental loss and security addressing malicious loss. And so for purposes of the systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility, solution design includes a modular perspective and a distinction between the concepts of develop and compose, uh, where we develop modules from scratch and then we use modules to compose solutions, either in a relatively static development environment uh, or in the dynamic environment of, of operations, uh, where we use dynamic composition to compose systems as well as to compose workflows. So the identification and reuse of patterns helps to facilitate uh, the movement toward modules and, and modular design. And so here's a, a set of types of patterns uh, that include system archetypes and architecture patterns, design patterns, decision patterns, uh, ecosystem patterns, and anti-patterns. And so in a, in a system archetype, uh, these are the recurrent motifs in system dynamics. And to many people, these will look familiar. Here's some examples, you know, fixes that fail, limits to success, um, tragedy of the commons, and there's, there's lots of examples out there in, in system dynamics. Architecture patterns capture and reuse system modules to compose systems and capture and reuse operational modules to compose workflows. Design patterns, uh, these are the most uh, familiar to people, and these capture and reuse development knowledge. Uh, there's also the concept of decision patterns that capture and reuse operational knowledge. And then there's uh, ecosystem patterns uh, which capture and reuse knowledge of a community of, of entities. And so there's, there's lots of research and writing out there on the concept of ecosystems. And, and indeed there are ecosystem patterns that we can use in our uh, design of uh, that inherent adaptability. And then for sure, anti-patterns would just capture ways that we know not to work. And so, you know, don't wanna go there, there be dragons. And so as, as I'm looking forward uh, for, to next steps, uh, the big question is, you know, where do we go from here? And, and the systems engineering, the conditions of the possibility framework 
provides a context for dozens of research areas. And two of those areas uh, are two categories are algorithmic design and axiomatic influence. And so the algorithmic design research includes things like set-based design uh, that help to enumerate options that are readily available when they're needed. Um, and and set-based design is, is used right now in development. Uh, I have a hypothesis that it can be applied in operations uh, for the dynamic uh, invocation of certain options uh, according to unfolding context. Um, category theory helps with set relationships, uh, compositionality theory, combinatorics, uh, there's a fascinating um, discipline that's emerging called quantum cognition, which is the application of quantum mechanics for the modeling of uh, human decision making. Uh, and of course, I mean, AI and machine learning is, is, is critical for adaptable systems and any kind of autonomy. Um, DLT, the distributed ledger technology, uh, again, this is a hypothesis, uh, looks like it may have application for the implementation of mechanistic trust. Uh, such that a uh, community of machines, uh, by virtue of their interaction, uh, can establish trust outside of any manual intervention. Uh, Rick Dove and I are, are writing something on uh, techno-social techno contracts to, to explore that concept a little bit more. Uh, Bayesian belief networks, uh, just quantifying dependency and causality. Uh, uncertainty quantification, there's, there's a whole mathematical discipline emerging under, under uncertainty. And for sure, we, we are dealing with uncertainty with any kind of dynamic adaptation uh, of the system. Uh, portfolio theory, network theory, viable systems theory, and, and so on. And so those are all algorithmic approaches to, the, to implement this concept of continual dynamic adaptation. Uh, and they have their, their, their purpose, at least uh, in, in my hypotheses. Uh, but just in case we run into something that they don't cover, we need the concept of, of axiomatic influence. And this is the ability to design and operate to principles for when algorithms are unprepared or, or they fail. And for example, one axiom uh, is do no harm, uh, which sounds good on the surface, but if indeed we uh, designed a system to do no harm, it could never win a chess game uh, because there is that concept of sacrifice uh, for the greater good. So we may have a tactical sacrifice for the strategic advantage. Uh, so in addition to do no harm, we might consider things like minimize unintentional harm. And so unintentional harm uh, acknowledges that harm may happen. Uh, and then an additional one would be minimize intentional harm. And so intentional harm acknowledges that harm will happen. And so if we say it will happen, how, we have to anticipate it. And how can we uh, deal with that? And so those axioms would pick up where the, uh, where the algorithms would, would fail. Uh, and then the, the concept of culturally adaptive systems, um, because even if we manage to encode the resolution of moral dilemmas in autonomous systems, uh, the acceptable action in one culture, uh, say the US, would not be acceptable in another culture, say China. And so even though we solved it, that solution itself has to be uh, adaptable under uh, various contexts. And so uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, we've covered a whole lot of concepts in, in a very short time. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Let's go. You guys can go ahead and unmute if you have a question you want to try to do. We're looking for uh, questions on the chat. Or I did have uh, one suggestion uh, for you, Keith, that you might like. Uh, for the solution and tools, you're trying to think of a new phrase. Mm -hmm. You could call it system engineering tradecraft. I don't know if that's because it kind of brings into the account of how we utilize the tools in such a way that that um, that they will meet the objective means that you're trying to do. Just an idea, throwing it out there. And yeah, I need to think about that a bit because yeah, it's in, in certain contexts, um, 
same tools and solution make sense, but in an enclosed system, it doesn't. So I'm trying to think of something that covers both. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally true. All right. Anybody else? I mean, and if there's no questions, I'm more than happy to accept comments as in, you know, what the heck is this? Or, or you know, where, where are we going with this? Um, but just looking forward, I, I think that we have to accommodate the design of inherently adaptable systems. And these are some initial thoughts on, on trying to get to that formal discipline to do it. I, I know um, that this sounds a little out of there, but when you're, what, what are your issues with running into the um, opportunity aspects? Do, are there roadblocks or, or just uh, difficult aspects to it that, that you're running into? I mean, it seems to me the opportunity, that's kind of the opposite of risk, right? We're always going for opportunities. It, it's the other side of, coin, of the coin, because the, the risk management, I think, has right. two sides. Uh, one is right. addressing loss, and the other is addressing opportunity. The traditional way to think of it is opportunity cost. You know, what, what didn't we realize by virtue of not choosing other options? Oh, okay. And so I'm, I'm taking that concept and expanding it a bit uh, into some concept of uh, preemptive, proactive adaptation uh, with the anticipation of satisfying um, stakeholder needs without an explicit change of stakeholder needs. Can I provide comment about your opportunity space? Please. This is Shirley saying from the LA chapter. Uh, and I've been sort of um, getting up to speed on entrepreneurship ecosystem because I think opportunity space could map into um, new business development, new product development. It would be um, looking at entrepreneurs creating new value, looking at what unmet needs are out there and um, uh, filling in that upfront space before you get to a point where you have a, um, an RFP, I need this, this, this. So these are looking like um, uh, what currently they use for like challenges to, I have a problem, mm -hmm. I don't really know what to do. And what's currently popular is, is challenges like uh, X-Price, you know, uh, mm -hmm. moonshots. So you use those strategies to fill in the gap of what like what opportunity space. And within the entrepreneur community, you have what they call business model canvas. I don't know if you've seen that, mm -hmm. which yeah. looks at uh, what the, the answer is the basic question for a startup as to um, what the customers want, you know, who needs to be involved with your startup and Mm -hmm. what other competitors out there. So, so those are sort of elements of the opportunity space is what I see as um, what's um, opportunity driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yes, and I think there's something to that um, because uh, taking lessons learned from say lean startup uh, right. would, would fall into your suggestion uh, right. and any kind of formalization of uh, innovation. Right, and, and there's a class of people co that call themselves business analysts that work with um, um, their companies to sort of look at the, the future product and what it should be. So traditionally it would be like um, doing focus group on you know, what is it that, what's our next generation product should be like and then you, um, you have, you typically conduct market research, you know, have focus group, mm -hmm. invite customers to have them sample these different products or just ask them what they are missing from their cars mm -hmm. or whatever. So those yeah. are new feature development. Yep. Yep. Because th this is that classic um, uh, balance between explore and exploit. Uh, right. So if right. the system is doing exactly what it needs to, just keep exploiting that. Fantastic. Yeah. It, uh, and I guess it's not a traditional aerospace system, James, because typically for aerospace system, you, you have a, a set of requirements that's already given to you. But mm -hmm. there are other people 
that's in a commercial space that have to imagine um, what the customer's needs are or invent things to fill gaps in society or um, our current, so our current um, election system's broken. You know, what, what can we do about that type of, so it's this type of problems. And, and they do have some methodology that they've already, that people, people are using, you know, some of the design thinking and then more of a visionary type. And I also mentioned the, uh, the challenges so that's uh, mm -hmm. so for like research roadmap it's less um less quantified but more open-ended so what currently happens i think in the u.s is we have the national academy of sciences and they're chartered to go out look for grand problem grand challenges grand opportunities and they come up with these reports but typically they just sort of sit there as reports and it, the cycle, the time between issuing the reports and some action from it is very um, has hazardous. So you can probably say that might be the case with a lot of research that people do research and mm -hmm. it doesn't go anywhere, especially yeah. ac academics. Let me, let me provide a, an, an example where this might happen um, uh, within a system during operation, and this was an example uh, of an autonomous vehicle, mm -hmm. is that uh, it dropped off its uh, rider and it was going to park. And mm -hmm. it proceeded to go over and park in an area that was clearly marked uh, illegal. Mm -hmm. And so there was a concern about coming back out and finding a ticket on the vehicle. Uh, and it turns out that proactively, uh, or at least I'm sure by design, but proactively it had gone out and found new regulations for that particular area. And uh, where it, it had posted that parking was illegal, uh, it was after the time of restriction. Uh -huh. The uh, rider of the vehicle had no clue, but the system itself adapted on the fly, uh, added value to that stakeholder uh, by virtue okay. of parking close by. Uh, so that it, it's things like that in operations uh, that I'm trying to get at with this concept of, of, of opportunity driven. Uh, so, and, and lessons learned from the design process and innovation process, I, I think there's something there for sure. Mm -hmm. Hello, <clears throat> Hello, Keith, this is Mark Evans. I, yeah. I had a question back in your earlier part of your brief, I think it was slide uh, four or five. You talked about uh, cause and effect and that precept being somewhat dated or limited. And I, perhaps I misunderstood what you were trying to say there, but I didn't, didn't uh, understand why the cause and effect model is um, not complete. You know, there was something beyond cause and effect that you were considering. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we're traditional systems engineering. Um, right, on that one. Cause effect. Um, do, you, do you recall the statement you made about why yeah. you were going beyond cause and effect as a, as a traditional model? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm tr trying to just tra transcend cause and effect. Uh, cause and effect, it, it implies some aspect of determin determinability. It's deterministic. And, and I think as we're looking at, at systems uh, in, in AI and that need for uh, inherently adaptable, we need to transcend that cause effect uh, to include the non-deterministic. Oh, okay, I see. So you're, so like in the case of maybe a, um, a dynamic or a chaotic system, you, you don't necessarily think cause and effect has an influence there? It, it would probably still have an influence, but I think we need more than just cause effect. Okay. Yeah, where it takes in the circumstance or the context, um, and there, there may not be a direct trigger for change, but there may be indirect indicators of the need for change. Okay. I, yeah. I guess I always thought about that, and particularly in complex systems, a slightly different way where uh, there's, there's still a cause. It just, we may not ever be able to identify it 
or easily uh, isolate what the cause is, you know, mm -hmm. and there are many systems where you can see the effects and you have no idea what, what caused the effect. Uh, yes. And, and I mean, strictly speaking, if you, infinite regression being what it is, somewhere back there is something that triggered an action. And uh, sometimes it's better to find that indicator of a problem and fix it five steps before it actually becomes a problem. Right. And okay. uh, in, in that sense, it's quite deterministic. Uh, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm still holding on to that uh, hypothesis, that, that potential uh, for dealing with the non-deterministic, something that has to transcend that cause effect. But with that in mind, if you go back two slides from where you're saying, you're, you're actually talking about the expected deterministic and then unexpected non-deterministic, but isn't unexpected or something you didn't expect? The, the very definition means how can you design for it? You know, I, I mean, it's just, if it's something that we can't perceive because it's unexpected, you're trying to get ahead of that, right? I mean, what? Exactly, yes. So and, what is your, how do you do that? I mean, what, I know that's kind of what you're trying to get at, I guess, in this whole three. Exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's, that's the essence of what I'm trying to get at is okay. that- we, I, I got it now. Yeah, by, by virtue of designing in the conditions, yeah. uh, we create yeah. those conditions to realize the possibility. And and in this particular slide, we're, we were you know expecting a cube, so we designed for right. that. Right. But we also developed the conditions such that the emergence of a sphere uh, that turns out to be exactly what we needed is possible. Oh, it, to me, it's an unintended consequences, uh, but from a positive standpoint, it sounds like you're unintended consequences because of, it's an emergent property that we had no way of, of, because there's no, I don't know the science of emergence. I, that's the thing that gets me is there's, unless you build a model of your system, I don't believe you can put science into it. You know, you can use the science to build the model, but the emergence is something that but, and they're in that's out of our control, I guess. Well, well, uh, to a degree, right? Because to a degree, in, yeah. Because you model, yeah, of, of emergence is um, you, you get unexpected results, right? Like who knew by putting all of these together that right. we would end up with with that, right? With, with that in mind, mm -hmm. you can't expect it, but you have to build it and see it. So. And what I'm trying to get at, trying, is, um, is a disciplined way that we might actually be able to uh, identify some relationships between what we design and that which comes along that we don't expect, that concept of emergence. Right. Um, it is somewhere along the line, to a degree, I think, um, we could tweak it. Yes, yes. If you, if you model something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. We worked through that. It, it's a challenge. I, I've been thinking about this too for a long, long time. So, yeah, and, and thinking about it in the abstract is one thing. Trying to write it down. Oh yeah, and, man, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> trying to describe it's tough. Well, I went down the rabbit hole of emergence, and there's no get, getting out of that. I mean, once you go down, it's like, oh man, digging out of that. Impossible. Well, but there's a there's a very subtle line there that you cross. You you are not saying that there's you're trying to model a non causal system, right? No, I thought you try to model a causal system, but you get these unexpected causalities from it. I don't want to get too wrapped up in the term model. Oh, okay. Okay, get away from that. But let's All say. Right. It, Take a non-causal system and a simple definition of that is you can have an output with no input. That's, that's one simple definition of a system that is non-causal, right? You, you go to a black box system, you look at the output, you've got some output, but you didn't put anything into the input. That's a non-causal system. And I don't know how you use science or any type of design technique for that, do you? Well, in, in, in math, you can in math you can describe it, but you can't build it. You know, that's the that's the whole issue. In math, if you can 
describe it and calculate it, then there's a potential to encode it. True. I mean, there, 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 there may be a possibility that you could build it, but it wouldn't, um, it would not be an example, it would not be an example of anything useful to, to our, to our way of thinking, you know, yeah. to, to our current way of thinking in traditional systems engineering. Yes. Yeah, you try to, there is you try to get us out of that. Right. Yeah, it's a real challenge. It really is. Yeah. Interesting. Good. Well, you, you all are seeing the mind bending aspects of this. This is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, there's right. another, there's another classic with these and I'll, I'll just give it to you. There's a, the, the idea of a rusty diode, which is um, a total, you, you hook a rusty diode up to an output amplifier and you will have the definition of a totally random bit stream. And if you ever wanted to build an encryptor or an encryption system that was totally unbreakable, you just use a rusty diode to encrypt the information. The, the problem is, is at the receiving end, you can't, you can't get back to the plain text. <laughs> so it's kind so, of useless. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, you, you think about that, but it's a, it's a interesting thing to think about in, in this area of non-causal systems or unexpected non-deterministic non kinds of things. Because there's an example, easy example of a system that has an output and, and what do you do with it, you know? Well, we'll let, um, I, unless there's some more questions, Dave uh, Aldridge, did you want to ask I, something? I have a question. This is Jeff Burlett. I didn't want to type it all in. So Yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> so, uh, Keith, this is Jeff Burlett. A very good briefing. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an ESEP with NCOSI and also an officer with Chesapeake Chapter. I have a question for you. Um, with the non-deterministic uh, systems that you were discussing, I wonder how standard bodies and accreditation bodies are going to handle, um, you know, systems that don't function only as expected, right? And I'm thinking of ANSI and UL and ISO and all the rest that uh, accredit uh, consumer products, electronics, uh, hardware devices, um, the mechanical systems, those type of things. Um, they built their reputation on on testing precise functionality that is very deterministic. So how will this be matched or how will this gap be um, closed uh, in a non-deterministic world? Great question, yes. Um, part of the intent of machine learning is you end up with a system uh, that will do things unexpected. Part of our challenge is to know if those unexpected things are better than we could have come up with ourselves, uh, still within the bounds of what we truly want. You know, it's not going out and some, do, doing some deviant behavior. And by nature, it grows and transcends from the initial design. Uh, so if the requirement is give me a system that changes according to its circumstances and becomes better, you can test that it does that and it satisfies the requirement, but I understand it, it, it creates that, that paradox of you want it to be deterministic, but you ask for a system that's non-deterministic. But so the accreditation is, you have to rethink the accreditation philosophy. Yeah. I, I, yes, I think we Because accreditation is always against a standard or something that you expect. Right. Yeah. And so and, if and a non-deterministic accred accreditation is what And therein lies the, the whole testing behind accreditation. You yeah, have a whole right. defined set of, of inputs and known yeah. outputs and does it do that? And a whole defined set of known inputs and, and undesired outputs. Does it not do that? And, and this introduction of machine learning and AI and dynamic yeah. adaptation changes that very much. So accreditate, we may have to have something other than accreditation for these type of yeah. systems. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and that's always been the big question for me is, okay, hey, this machine learning did something completely radical. Yeah, is it is. good? Yeah, right. I, I don't know. <laughs> can, this is surely again, can I make a suggestion? Because one of the things um, that might be an option, because you know, with machine learning, you will get uh, it will learn and it will evolve. But 
I think you need to sort of define um, conditions or uh, thou shalt not, as you said, the anti-patterns. For example, like for robots, thou shalt not kill, right? The, the three rules and, or um, do no harm. Mm -hmm. so, some um, boundary so that um, the system has some conditions to uh, run against so, or some matrix of some performance so that <clears throat> it doesn't run open loop. It's just some thought because, mm -hmm. I mean, if you do have a drone, you know, <laughs> you, yeah. you need to identify some boundaries that as it uh, makes decision to go certain places. And, and All right, we're going to, uh, <laughs> we're getting <laughs> close to the end here and we want to wrap our book. But okay. if you don't mind hanging out, um, Keith, a little bit afterwards, we do allow people to um, just go ahead and, and talk. And a lot of times we have a lot of fun with that. Um, so, but right now we're going to, we, we've got about uh, 12 or 13 people here. And one of them is going to bring this book, right? That's right. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to spin the wheel here. The attendees here. And it looks like Carrie Lippert is the winner. And I never win um, anything ever. <laughs> well, awesome. Carrie, you cannot say that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Lippert. Yeah, I'm going to reach out to you via the email that you um, registered with, Carrie, unless you okay. want, want me to do some other method, just chat me that email but i'll i'll reach out to you via the email and get your address and i'll mail you the book okay that hey, works. congratulations you're gonna love the book thanks yeah one final comment I, I don't have it i haven't read yet so i'm oh. looking forward to it it looks i have the copy right here beside me it looks like a very interesting book as a matter of fact it'll probably be dog-eared because clinton read it before <laughs> you got it so <laughs> Hey, let me make one final comment before we go to the cafe general chat uh, for members here. Um, I just want to promote that coming up next month, we're going to be hosting a favorite chapter speaker and also a renowned professor of systems engineering. Everyone uh, probably knows him is Dr. Howard Eisner. Um, we originally had scheduled Dr. Eisner to give his talk as a half day tutorial. Uh, early in the year, but then COVID happened. And, and due to that, we decided to reschedule and also reformat his talk to present it as part of our regular lecture series. So um, to accommodate this, next month's lecture is going to be a little extended, I think 30 minutes extra or so. Um, and in October here, he's going to introduce to the chapter what he terms a new and sparse method of system architecting. So I think his talk will produce um, some engaging discussion and I hope to see everybody there. Um, and so we'll leave the room here open if people want to continue to ask questions or chat uh, amongst yourself. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, before we... Uh, before we do that, if everybody could uh, do me a favor and get uh, turn your video on, I just want to get a picture for our website. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my, where is my video? Now I lost it. Ah. Our videos are turned off, it looks like. At least. Yeah, I know. I'm turned off and I'm the one person who wants this on. Where's my, oh, there it is. I have to go down here. Everybody's doing great. Oh. There we go, meeting controls. Okay, I'm up. Ah. <laughs> All right, now everybody has to smile for me. Let me make you nice and big. All right, here we go. Nice and smile. Perfect. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Um, and look for the website for uh, that as we uh, go on here. <laughs>